Hi, this is Mary from Teacher's Pet Dog Training. Today we're going to take a closer look on how to structure your training to maximize your dog's learning. We do this by creating a training sandwich where we have three parts of our lesson. The first one is a warm-up, about one to two minutes where we increase our dog's focus on us. The second one is the meat of the lesson. This goes about three to five minutes in which we teach our dog and reinforce a new skill. And the last one is a cool down. It's one to two minutes of allowing your dog to re-engage with us with something that is really fun for the dog and allows them to cool down. So a sandwich for a dog is the first thing we want to make sure is that we start with having something that's engaging for the dog, something that they're connected to, that I have something that they want that's fun. And then that's, that gives us sort of our little warm up. There we go, there we go, there we go, yay! So the first part would be a one to two minute warm up that engages the dog in having um, an activity. We're doing something with the dog that warms them up, that's fun, whether it's tugging or whether it's uh, engaging them with food or having a little mini event. That's one to two minutes. When we talk about engaging our dog, we want our dog to be engaged in whatever it is that we're doing, but we want to make sure that they're engaged but they can still think and make good choices. So there's a sort of what we call a balance between low drive and something where we call over threshold or high drive. And our dogs have a hard time if they're low drive and they would have a hard time if they're absolutely losing their mind. So they can't concentrate, they can't think, they're really over threshold with whatever it is we're doing and they just make really poor choices. So remember we want that balance in the middle and that's us working with our dogs to get that. So we don't expect too much in the beginning. We play, we engage, and we start getting them to want to be able to, be able to play and engage, but keep them in balance, sort of in the middle, where they're making super good choices. They're able to still follow through what we're asking for, but they're not dulled out and neutral where they've lost uh, their drive to want to be with us and play with us. And they're not so over threshold that they're just running around like their head's cut off, where they're, they're losing their mind. Come. You'll notice in this video that we're using a long line, which is just a long leash, a 25-foot leash. And the reason that we're using it is I want to make sure that when I send uh, the tug out that I can help Brant come back. Sometimes what Brant would want to do is take the tug and then run around the yard with it. So this helps him make the connection that sending it out and bringing it back to me is really fun and rewarding. And so when I can start to get some reps in this, and I can get him to see that coming back to me is really fun because we play a game of tug, then I can start getting him to rehearse this behavior on a continuous uh, cycle. And so that's why we're using Out. the long line in our work here. Yes. Out. Out. Yes. Out. Yes. Out. Yes. Out. Yes. Bring. Come on, buddy. Come on. So in this clip as well, notice that I am using a tug toy and I'd like to recommend that you go to my website and look at how to learn how to tug with your dog. Uh, there are some really critical steps in doing that uh, that you'll need to know before you get what uh, Brant and I are doing here. Then when you go to end a session, it's super important that once we out the toy, we say all done and then we hand the pup a couple pieces of food. Out. All done. Good boy. All done. All right. All right. So, alright, we're going to do a little bit of send away recall with this little guy here. So, we're going to send him out to get a little piece of food and we are going to use a long line as our little insurance policy to get him back. I send out the food, I let him get the food, I ask him to come back. And if he comes back, I make sure I pay multiple treats when he comes back so that he knows that really good things happen when he comes back. And again, I use the leash then to help me be able to ensure that I get a, a nice recall from him. Hi. Good boy, ready? Ready, ready, ready. Oh boy. 
Whenever we're first teaching a behavior, it's important that we're using food because we can reinforce small pieces and then we can build on that. Once the dog really knows the behavior and they like playing with the toy, then we can add that toy as our reinforcer or as our reward. I'm using cheese because cheese is white and you can see it on the grass, find it. And then that way it makes it a little bit easier for him to pick up the item. If I was using something like Happy Howie's or roast beef or something that was dark or Zooks, those types of things, a lot of times the dog can't see them. And so they have to just rely on their nose to find it. Whereas with this little piece of cheese, because it's white, it's a little bit easier for them to be able to spot it. Super important that I have the leash in my hand. He's not wrapped up in the leash when I start this so that I don't wrap him up in it. Good boy. Good boy. Good. So I do a send away and then I have food and I'm ready to do multiple rewards when he comes back in. And I also give with the energy of him coming back in so he doesn't crash into me. So that way he can, I can absorb that energy coming in and coming back to me is super rewarding because he gets multiple rewards that are dynamic and they're exciting and it makes a mini event out of it. Just as if I were to use a toy. Are you ready, Brandy? Come! Yes! And then at the end of the session, we want to let the dog go all done, let him know, and then we end it on something just fun. So with Brant, he loves this deflated volleyball. We let him run around, he does jumps, he brings it, we tug a little bit with it. But everything's sort of free flowing and there isn't too much structure to it. Remember, I'm a big advocate of library learning over Magic Mountain learning. So we want to first teach them in the library where we don't have to compete against squirrels and birds and people and other dogs and cats and noises and all of those other things, sounds and smells that are all over the place. First we go to the library and we teach them in a neutral, very distraction-free setting. And then little by little we incrementally bring in more distractions. We don't go right to Magic Mountain as soon as we've done our, our work in the library. So we do it in tiers and we do it in scaffolding. So it's a little bit at a time. And before you know it, now they're able to, to engage with us um, even though they're in a distracting environment. And a really good sort of uh, a gauge of that is if I go out with my dog and my dog's doing fantastic, 
and then I go out and I try it somewhere else and my dog's just, it's not working, then I've put my dog in a setting that he's not ready for yet. So I have to go back, look at all the variables that are out there and introduce my dog to a lower threshold setting. And, or I need to go back and do more work in more of a distraction-free setting. I want my dog to be so invested in me that he doesn't see the mouse that runs by me. And, and in the beginning, that's not gonna happen. It's gonna happen incrementally. And the biggest mistake we make is we go from no distractions to too many distractions. And we expect way too much of our dog way too soon. So if, and the other thing is, if they haven't learned at the park at all, we can't expect them to do any behaviors in the park because we haven't practiced it in the park. So we might want to go early in the morning when there aren't a bunch of things going on and then practice some really close sits or some downs or tossing just the, the item a foot away and then helping them back with the leash in the park when there isn't a lot going on. That's going to help him get used to the park but not again be in something that's way over his head. So you want to go to places but but be cognizant of what's happening during those periods of time. Go when there's low, low things, low distractions, minimal distractions, early, late in the evenings, where we know that there won't be as many things that are gonna set our dog up for failure. The key for everything is setting ourselves up and setting our dogs up for success. And then we can build on those successes until we have this amazing, amazing relationship between you and your dog. That's really, really cool. So I hope those tips helped. Get out there, have fun with your dog, and remember the key is success, success, success. If you're finding failures, go back. Start over, go back to a spot where you're gonna be successful and your dog's gonna be successful. Remember, you wanna be the person your dog thinks you are.